Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics Podcast. My name is Ahmed Hassan. And today we have a very interesting guest with me today is Ole Donner. Ole has a background in the German military intelligence corps. And today he's an intelligence trainer and consultant with his own company. And it's called Strukturierte Analyse Deutschland. Hopefully I said that well, uh, Ole. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Ole, what's your story? How did you get into this? I think out of uh, most intelligence professionals that I know, not many are as much of a student of the game as you are and put so much effort and time in the education side, I think, which we share. But could you go into like how your journey started and where you are today? Yeah, actually it started intelligence-wise in the Joint Force Command in Naples. I managed to, to do an internship there during my time with the military, so during my university time. And there I met someone uh, whose name is Mark Sellers. And he was like the senior analyst of the intelligence, knowledge, and production branch. And at the same time, he was doing a university degree in intelligence studies. And basically, he told me about structural analytic techniques, about uh, a whole bunch of intelligence literature, and also gave me a lot of reading material. So that's the, actually, that's the moment where I started to dig deeper into all that literature and all that, all that stuff that, you know, since then is just fascinating me. And yeah, since then I'm basically um, also beside university, I'm studying that. And when I finished university, I was stationed in, in an intelligence command in Germany. And there I worked as an all source analyst. And I tried to transfer what I learned at the Joint Force Command Naples and employ these techniques and, and all that educational stuff there. It was very hard to do that because as you can imagine, uh, people have done things like, you know, they were doing them for quite a bit. So there was already an established way to doing business. And then if, you know, a rookie comes in and is talking about all that stuff and structural analytic techniques and can we try that and can we try that, then that's very complicated, right? So it was a tough time regarding, you know, pushing things forward. And after three years there, I managed to switch and get transitioned to our school for military intelligence. And there, I really had the chance to change things. And I, I got the chance to do a new concept for our intelligence education regarding analysis. So they gave me the chance to set up a course design for a four week course of intelligence analysis. And I really focused on employing structured analytic techniques to get things done. And during this time, I also met Randy Fearson, uh, who unfortunately died on the 11th of January this year. And well, that was another, you know, another tick re regarding all that, right? Because he's like the grandmaster of structural analytic techniques. He was, he wrote like the book on the topic. So the Bible on structural analytic techniques which is structured analytic techniques for intelligence analysis. And I got to know him, you know, we exchanged ideas about things. I also played the role of the uh, naggy German who, who was asking for definitions because in, at that time there was no really definitions in the book. Uh, he adapted that in the third edition and that was a very important point in my career regarding structural analytic techniques, how to teach them, how to apply them, because it's very hard, you know, just to do it from the book. So you need at least once have someone showing you how they are employed properly. And so that was, was a very important part of it. So 
how was the process of joining the military in Germany? Is that something you, you knew you wanted to do from a young age or how, how did that come about? I wanted to do it right from the beginning. But as you know from the military, sometimes they tell you things that are not really the truth, sort of. <laughs> I, I, I believe we call those lies. <laughs> Tricks. So, so when I signed up, I, I basically, I described what I wanted to do, you know, to assess situations, to, to write assessments and, and all that. And they said, all right, then you have to join the infantry because the <laughs> intelligence corps is recruiting from the infantry. And so I joined the infantry and it was at the, at, actually at the officer's cadet school that I realized that that might not be the right start there because you can start in an intelligence, like earmarked with an intelligence profession there, which I did not. And so it was very hard to, you know, to get out of that. But finally it worked out basically because Germany abandoned the drafting model. And so there was too many infantry officers who were assigned to train draftees and well, no draftees, no instructors needed. And so just because of that, actually it was possible uh, at that time to switch profession and join the intelligence corps. So lucky me, right? Yeah. Uh, how long did that take that process? Uh, five years. So it, it was in my last, in the last year of university that they said, all right, you can, you know, you can leave the infantry and join the, the intelligence corps. Interesting. So, I mean, you and I have talked about this off the podcast a, a couple of times, but how does one become an intelligence analyst in Germany and what tracks are available to, to people that are listening? We have, we have a lot of listeners from Germany. Yeah. So it's not so very easy because what Germany is lacking actually, well, first of all, we have a lack of understanding the concept of intelligence. So if you go to the United States or you go to UK or whatever, and you are also in a business context and you say, I want to work in intelligence, then they know what you are talking about. And you can't do that in Germany because intelligence is not a concept which is commonly known and so of course we have like intelligence agencies so we have the foreign intelligence agency we have several uh, domestic intelligence agencies so they should have or have an understanding of intelligence but outside of that that's not very common and also we do not not have like a good translation of the term intelligence. So that's very complicated too. And maybe those are also reasons why there's also not like a public a bachelor or master for intelligence and security studies. So it was only in, in 2019 that the first master of intelligence and security studies started in Germany. And it's only available to join for public officials. So you have to be part of the military or you have to be part of an intelligence agency to join that master program. And so if you're like a young student or whatever, or leaving school and you say, I want to become an intelligence analyst, well, then it's very difficult to get there. So basically there are uh, three career paths available. The first one is like I did through the military. So you join the military and you become a military intelligence officer. So that's one, one way you can, you can go. The other is you can try to join the foreign intelligence service. So that's possible right out of school to, to join them, which might be a good thing to try. Or you can try to join the domestic intelligence service, which is the Verfassungsschutz. And we have that on the federal level, but also on the state level. And there you can also try to join right away. Now it is possible, but 
I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, it was not so very common because they usually recruited former police officers and stuff like that. So it was very homogeneous, so, so diverse inside their teams. So that's another possibility, basically. But if you just want to say, all right, I want to do that in a corporate context, then that's very complicated. So what you have to do then is you have to study something like security management and join a corporate security cell or department in a larger company where they also have intelligence functions and then try to join these functions. So basically those are the possibilities that I'm aware of, you know, that just, you know, from my perspective, uh, might be different, but from my perspective, those are like the career paths through which you can join intelligence in Germany. Do you think that obviously Germany is a, is a, is a big economy and, and a very developed country? Do you think, and I see this also with other European, but mainly European continental agencies and, and, and communities, that culture plays you know a significant role? Is culture a factor in in how intelligence is perceived and, and developed and, and talked about? Well, I think culture is one dynamic that, that comes into play when we talk about how intelligence as such is viewed in Germany, right? Because of the German history, I don't think that intelligence or the, especially the intelligence services are viewed with a lot of sympathy, at least during the, the past decades, right? I have got the sense that things are changing now because of the Russian war inside Ukraine. So people get aware of the fact that it does not get you anywhere to just be against like the military, be against intelligence services, be against the idea of agencies trying to increase security because in the end this will lead just to a lack of security and other forces will try to to use that and so i think or i hope at least that like the reputation of security agencies and intelligence agencies is on the rise in in germany so that yeah. f from a cultural perspective i think one factor that shapes the situation and from an intelligence education do you do you see the german government employing intelligence uh, specialist trainers consultants like yourself do you see a role for contractors because that's also not very common in europe outside of the uk i see a role so i think a lot of official bodies like the criminal police or also intelligence services, they would like to, to get expertise from outside, you know, to add up to their own expertise. But the problem right now is the problem of budgeting and the economy as a whole. So it's tough times for them to get a budget for someone coming from outside to do, for example, training. So that's that's a problem right now. But I sense an increase in awareness that you, you need to have or you need to increase the level of, of proficiency regarding intelligence, regarding structured analytic techniques. And there is awareness that it's very hard to master that just by yourself. So you need someone who, like I had, the luck, right, to, to see uh, Randolph Fierson actually twice uh, during two different trainings in my time with the Federal Armed Forces to see someone employing structured analytic techniques. So how does what I can read in the book, how does that look like in real life? And awareness is increasing that I need that at least once or twice to get things started. And so I think there's a market for it. There's a demand for it. There's a need for it. But 
right now it's not the best time to launch those projects. Although there are a lot of initiatives, company-wise, but also uh, official government body-wise, to increase the the level of proficiency regarding intelligence and structured analytic techniques. And I, w- I would like to switch gears a little bit. And can you tell us a little bit more about, we, we know now that there is a bit of a deficiency, as you said, in Germany, about your company and how that came about and, and what you guys do. So the idea to become self-employed and to to offer training, consulting, education in the field of intelligence and structured analytic techniques came during my time with the Federal Armed Forces. Because, of course, I also talked to other state officials and it became very clear that there's a demand and a need for better intelligence education. At the same time, there was a lack of, there was no one offering that in German language. So that is a very big problem because if the language barrier is so high that it would make no sense to get someone like Randolph Fierson in, for example, teaching criminal police or teaching um, domestic intelligence agency or something like that, then it's just a waste of money, right? To get someone like, like him to do a training. So I got aware of the fact that a unique selling point for a company in Germany would be to offer intelligence education in German language. And so that's a big part of why I became self-employed and why I am now offering training and consulting in German language. How's that going? It's going well, but the, the funny part about that is that my first big client then was NATO. Mm-hmm. And I had to, <laughs> I had to, you know, to, to, to translate everything back into English at that point. So that took a lot of time. And, but I'm very happy about that because big companies like Siemens, for example, they don't want to have a training on German, although they are German based, but their teams are not German only. So they need English language training. And uh, so I'm very happy that I invested all those all that time to create create like a two week course for NATO because I can use that now to also give English training. It's it's a, a funny because I saw you post about your training you did with Siemens, and yeah. one of the people. Uh, it's how small this this uh, this community is, but one of the people that was in that training, I think in a lead, leading function, was once an intern. For me, yeah, uh, I, great know dynamics. That, I know that. You know, yeah, we, we talked right. about that actually. Ah, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, yeah, uh, wonderful person, and um, I'm not gonna say the name because I don't know if, if they are, if they want me to. So I will, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, did a great job, by the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. very smart person. So intelligence education, and obviously this is something we have in common. Uh, we're building our courses and I know people listening to this yes it's coming guys and this is something I wanted to talk to you about there is I, and I try to be kind and I try to be nice about this but there's a lot of intelligence training quote unquote happening offline as well as online and a lot of that training is built around either OSINT or what what falls under OSINT today um, or it is uh, intelligence with a focus like you're doing on SATs and intelligence analysis and thinking about intelligence. So where do you see the, the training landscape today? Because I think what you're doing is is really great, but there is such a huge discrepancy between quality and what you're actually getting taught. And this is a question I we get a lot from from people that that follow our work and and, and that engage with us. Could you go in a little bit on that? 
Well, I think the first question that you have to answer for yourself is what do you really want to learn? Because especially if you, if you take OSINT, for example, most OSINT courses are collection courses. If you look at the intelligence cycle and you have direction, collection, processing, and dissemination, most OSINT courses are collection. So they teach you where to find what kind of information. And if that's what you're interested in, well, fair enough, do that course, check their credentials, check if they really know what they're talking about, right? So that's something that I would do no, what, no matter what, of course. But if that's not what you are looking for, because very often the problem is not that you have too less information. The problem is you have too much information. So the real challenge is to, to get a sense of how to apply that information, how to make sense of that information and how to create products that really push forward the decision-making process in your company or your state agency or whatever, so that you contribute in a meaningful way to that decision-making process. Because if that's the problem, then you should look for other kinds of training where you really learn how to process information. So then we are back in, in the field of intelligence analysis and look for a training there. And in general, and I just said that, you have to look, is the person delivering the course qualified in doing so? And that has nothing, not necessarily a lot to do with like the title of the person. So you can be a professor but only have like read about, for example, structured analytic techniques. And chances are pretty high that the training, such training will lack the quality you need in order to be able to really apply structured analytic techniques afterwards. Because it's one thing to read about these techniques and another thing to really see them in action. And so I would always check for, for that. So does the one delivering the course really has like practical real life experience in applying intelligence, in applying structure, also structured analytic techniques, right? And the next thing of course is try to find people who did the course already, who attended already and ask them, was that a course that improved your performance at work because it's not about I learned something and it was was inspiring and interesting but it has no value for my my real life work right because those trainings they are supposed to to increase your practical skills so that you can deliver results maybe faster or to have more rigor in your analytical process or to create in the end, of course, better products. So that should always be the goal, I think. All right. I was a little bit quiet because really well said. I think what I also would like to know from you is where do you see outside of your own like specialization within such analytic techniques and, and, and the wider intelligence analysis? Where do you see bottlenecks in in the process of intelligence and going from information to intelligence today, in a pro, in a professional setting as well as you know in education? So you mean where does it get complicated? Yeah, or, or where are there missing parts? Or where where sometimes people misunderstand or misuse these techniques? Yeah, so I think one very common problem that you have or challenge that you have is that the intelligence function of a company or a state agency is disconnected from the ones who decide. So disconnected from the decision maker. And then it can't work, right? Because intelligence, the sole purpose of intelligence is to increase decision making. And if there is a, a disconnection between decision-making and intelligence, you are not able to create meaningful products because you need the decision-maker to be 
involved at least at one point and that's the point of raising the right questions that afterwards you can answer with the capacities of your intelligence function and then you know push that back to the decision maker in time so that better decisions can be made and i think that's a very common problem that the intelligence department does not really know what the customer wants and the customer does not really know that he or she really has an intelligence function and what it can deliver, what it can contribute to decision making, right? So that's a, a really, really common problem, I think. Why do you think there is that disconnect between the two? I think one reason might be awareness. So if I'm a decision maker and I work in an environment where I never, never really encountered intelligence as a function and never really learned what intelligence can do for me and for my decision making, then I don't know how to use it, right? I don't know how to ask questions, where to, to push this, those questions to, you know, for them to, to answer those questions for me. And that's also a cultural thing. So if you have like a company, like a CEO from UK or from the United States, intelligence and intelligence functions are very common, right? And people know what you're talking about when you say I work in intelligence. But that's not true if you have like a CEO in Germany, then he or she might not necessarily encountered intelligence as a function in a company before, except it is like an international big company, right? Then maybe. So that's, I think, that's one reason why, at least in Germany, it might be very hard to, to create, to maintain, and to use intelligence inside the corporate context. Do you think that outside of awareness, receptivity is could be a problem? That maybe they know that there is intelligence and they just don't see the worth of it or they don't understand it? That could be another factor playing into all that. But then again, I think it is because the decision maker never really had a well-functioning intelligence department before because if you had that once you want it again right if you really are aware what an intelligence function also in a, in a corporate environment can provide for decision making then you will use that later on too so i think that's a very important a very important point there in this journey and and now you know you you went from the military to to the private sector and, and kind of back into the military because you're still teaching. Could you, outside of like German context, but for an international context, could you give some advices on, on how to get into intelligence uh, that's maybe more broader than, than the German scenario, let's say that? I mean, internationally, there are a lot of opportunities to take courses in that, to study in intelligence master, for example, you can do that in King's College, you can do that in, in Brunel. So there are different opportunities to study that. If you've got the feeling that you're interested in intelligence, but you really don't know what it is all about, then I always, and I also advise that to young intelligence professionals to read at least three different books. The first book is Thinking Fast and Slow by uh, Dr. Daniel Kahneman. The second book is Psychology of Intelligence Analysis by Richard Hoyer. And the third book is Structured Analytic Techniques for Intelligence Analysis. Because what Kahneman did is he laid the foundations psychology-wise for what later on became Structured Analytic Techniques. Richard Hoyer, in his book, Psychology of Intelligence Analysis, he asked himself the question, all right, if that's something that has an influence on our decision-making, on how we sense the world, how we 
remember things or don't remember things, what does that mean for the field of intelligence and for analysts? And so he wrote this brilliant, brilliant, really brilliant book, which I, I think I read it now three or four times. And each time I think, well, that's a great book and you can download it for free, right? You just have to type in the title and, uh, with Google and then uh, it'll show you the document. So he, he did that. And he also invented like the first structured analytic techniques specifically designed for the field of intelligence which is, for example, the very famous analysis of competing hypotheses. Well, and then, well, actually, it was the case that Richard Hoyer wanted to, to write a book on structural analytic techniques. And at the same time, Randolph Fierson meant to write a book about it. And so they decided to join forces and to write a book together, which now is Structural Analytic Techniques for Intelligence Analysis. And if you have read all those three books, then you already have a very good pickup point regarding the question, what is intelligence analysis? What is important? What to look for? And you also get a sense of how to apply at least easy structured analytic techniques like chronologies and timelines, for example. So that's a very good starting point to decide what you want to do with your life if you don't know if you want to join in the, the intelligence field, or if you're already joined, then it's a very good starting point because depending on the country you are in, that really gives you a base of knowledge that you really can employ afterwards. And if at some point you want to become a leader in intelligence, then I would advise to read a fourth book, and that's Leading Intelligence, Lessons from the CIA Analytic Frontline by Bruce E. Pease. And that's, that's the best book I read so far on intelligence leadership. It's great. So, and all that, you know, even if you have no formal education, then you can use that to build the core of an analytical mindset. And that will help you not only if you join the profession of intelligence, it will help you in life. Well said. I think I agree with pretty much everything you said there. This is something we talk about a lot with, with our young analysts. And it's very difficult. This is, um, you have to, um, and this is for any analyst or, or aspiring analyst listening to this, because we, we cover more than just the anal analytic part. But I think it's also very important to be hungry for knowledge and a student of the game. If you're not, it's going to be very difficult to be even a decent analyst. I think it's going to be very difficult to become because you have to have the willingness to do the work to improve yourself. And for us, what we see, and I don't know if you agree with that or, or what you are, or how you feel about this, but one of the major bottlenecks that I see outside of analytic mindset and, 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 and how to do analysis is how to convey your findings, how to write and how to brief, which is something we put a lot of effort in. Could you say a little bit more about that and, and what your opinion on that is? If you're not able to deliver your results in a clear, concise, and convincing way, then it does not matter how good your product is. It's, you know, just in vain. So you will not create any added value. I think that's clear. And what I try to also try to teach at the basic level is the AIMS technique. So it is about audience. You have to ask yourself, who is your final customer? And I really mean the final customer, which usually is the decision maker. You have to be sure what's the issue. So what's the problem you are trying to solving? So what's the question you are trying to answer. And you have to put a lot of effort in that step. Because if you do not have the right question to answer, then it does not matter how much effort you put into the whole product creation process, into visuals or whatever. Then, of course, obviously, it will have no impact at all. So that's the I in AIMS. The M is the message. So what's your core message? 
that you want to deliver. And you can compare that with the headlines in, in serious newspapers. And you should always try to focus one product on one message. If you have more than one message, then it might be better to create a second product instead of overloading one product because attention is limited. And that's especially true for decision makers because there's, you know, a lot of stuff is going on in their minds, on their desk, a lot of meetings. So don't overburden them. So be clear on the message. And the final thing is in AIMS, you have to have a clear storyline. So you need to have good pieces of evidence and you need to combine those pieces of evidence through reasoning with good conclusions. And it needs to be clear how you came from evidence to conclusions. And if you have all that as a starting point for creating a product, then you are better off than let's say 60% of all analysts who do not think about those things. Yes. I think probably the best uh, structured way anybody has said it in this podcast. So, so, so really uh, thank you for that. I mean, you've mentioned already a lot of techniques and processes. I think in the next phase, we can go a little bit about, you know, what we're trying to achieve together. But do you have, first of all, do you have a question for me? Well, the question a lot of people are thinking about right now might be, when do the courses start, right? <laughs> Why don't you have to put me into this? Well, um, I can say, depending on when this podcast comes, comes out, but I can say fairly securely it comes out in March. We will, we will open, uh, and that's a couple of weeks. So I think this podcast will not come out immediately, but we will, we will aim that. But yeah, that's March of 2024. That's... Uh, that's our aim. And, and for anybody that's wondering, like, why is it taking so long? We thought it was a great idea to get a third party to accredit our courses. And it was, it is a good idea, but you have to understand that if you're working with universities, they work at university speed. And you have to understand that and, and you know, roll with the punches as it were. So, so yeah, that's, that's uh, that's that's my answer, but I think it's a good way to segue into what we're trying to do together. You're, you're doing a couple of workshops that are maybe not well, maybe I noticed they are a level above what we are doing with the fundamental courses. And could you talk in a little bit about that? Yeah, but I will have a second question. Okay, but uh, just to answer your question, so. What we will do is we will incorporate two different, I call them deep dive days. So it is one day with one or top is two different topics, which are essential to intelligence analysis. And then we have a whole day where I will be there giving the course and the participants will, of course, they will listen to, to, to the, to the lecture itself. But I will also explain different techniques and they have to apply those techniques so that at the end of those deep dive days, they really uh, go away with further tools added to their toolkit, which they can employ immediately in their work. And so far, there are two different deep dive days. The first one is getting it right from the start. And we will focus on two main points. The first is know your customer. And I already said that if you don't know your customer and you don't know the needs, um, the, the, like the situation of the customer and what he or she is trying to achieve, then you will not be able to create products that really aid the decision-making process. The second topic is question asking in intelligence. And that's one of my favorite topics because usually it is not taught out there, right? And I think one reason is because people think, well, question asking, everyone can ask questions. If you Google how many questions a three-year-old child is asking per day, you will find numbers between 300 and 500 questions. And I, I have two little children, so that's like 600 to 1,000 <laughs> questions a day, right? I, yeah. I know that's true. But I can assure you, not all those questions are good questions. 
And this does not change just because we grow up, right? So we will spend a big portion of this getting it right from the start deep dive day on question asking in intelligence. We will take a look at what are good questions, what are bad questions, what are, let's say, not well formulated questions. And we will take a look at two different structured analytic techniques that you can employ to raise well and well formulated questions. And that's the issue redefinition and the analytical spectrum. And then the second deep dive day is called navigating uncertainty. And basically it's about hypothesis generation and testing because usually or to formulate it differently, when do you need an intelligence function? You need it when the answer to your question is not out there, right? If the, the answer would be out there, then you would need someone, you know, someone who's good at knowledge management, who just can get you that answer and then that's it, right? But in intelligence, usually the answer is not clear. The, the piece of information to answer the question asked is not out there. So what you only can do is you can raise probably true explanations for things that are happening or that happened. And then you have to, to test those rival explanations. And that's hypothesis generation and testing. And we will take a look at two different techniques to, to formulate hypotheses. And we will do a very focused look on the analysis of competing hypotheses, the ACH, and how to employ this, uh, this technique. So that's the deep dive days. All right. Sounds great. Actually, I, w I even want to like go and, and refresh my, uh, my knowledge. I would like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know what, we are going to do it. And I wanted to, or you wanted to ask me another question you said. Yeah. What I'm asking, also I'm asking myself is with all these new technologies coming up, like um, all these social media things like TikTok and stuff, where your attention span is like trained to be like 15 seconds long. How do you think this is influencing the field of intelligence where you might need more than 15 seconds of attention for one topic? It's incredibly difficult to, I mean, it will become increasingly difficult really, because it is influencing. It's influencing hugely a whole generation of people, but also people that, and I think TikTok is not the only one. I think other social media have done it too. For us, the way that we, that we combat this is we, we don't foolheartedly go continue doing how intelligence normally is done. We try to keep it short and sweet to get you the main, the key takeaways, the key judgments. And if you, if those intrigue you or, or, or you want to know more and they help you decision make with your decision making, then the evidence is there and the, the analysis is there, analytic comments are there. So, so that's kind of for us a way for on the online audience mainly for the offline audience we do pretty much exactly the same we have clients some that listen to this podcast so I'll, i know i know it will get back to me that they're just very busy people and they need to know they need to know the intelligence as soon as possible and they want to be able to one maximum two pages and i uh, what i need to know if i have if i have a request for more there's appendices for that, you know, here's a map, here is an explanation. So we have turned our, our methodologies because we cannot change people's mindsets, you know, that, that's done, you know, we don't have the budget to, to, to do some sort of counter attention span depletion. But what we can do is, is capture those, uh, capture the, 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 the little attention that you have. And the way we do that, it's one of the things that we talk about our courses is we use proven techniques from other professions, from copywriting, from marketing on how to, and it's almost, you have to almost game the mind of the reader 
not lie to them or trick them in, 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 in such a way, but intrigue them, pull them in. So use of emotional language, you know, even though in intelligence writing that said that you shouldn't do that, but um, you have to, a stupid but simple thing, right? In your sentences, use a bold word, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, sure. it sounds it's, incredibly simple, it but can it? Yeah, they can scan it and they say, "Oh, the, I need to know that." Um, one of the things we are, and I think people that that follow our work, people that have subscribed to to our reporting, they will notice we are obsessed with structure, right? So that's something that we hammer in all of our writers and, and analysts that 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 write for us and they work with us, that they have to understand that your audience, your customer, doesn't have the time. So how do you maximize, first of all, how do you capture their attention and how do you keep their attention? And I think that's something that has been developed over the past five years. And, uh, and we even seen this with the, you know, the, the presidential daily brief with, where Trump only wanted to let pictures yeah, right. um, well, videos would be great, right? Yeah, yeah, videos would be great, and and honestly, it, it's it's a it's a nice segue into it. That's where the direction that we are going. In. We are gonna turn our reports; they will continue to be written, but we're gonna create video versions of them, and still uh, having the same the same rigor and robustness of intelligence, but in a more digestible and and what people are used to. Way and I think also on the other hand, it's also very important if when everybody's going right to go left and in some in some ways you have to books book sales are still doing amazingly well right and there's a reason for that there's still people interested in that so let's not just throw the baby out with the bathwater as they say and so so in that sense so we we still do the long form stuff we have. We have in-depth pieces that are like over 10,000 words on the website. So there is demand because the numbers are there. Uh, so that's kind of like how we balance it out. I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you've, you've mentioned a couple of great ones, um, but what at the moment you are you reading? What are you watching? What are you listening to? It doesn't have to be even intelligence-based, but... Uh, just to get a little bit into the mindset of, of Oli. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what I'm listening to, uh, of course, Great Dynamics podcast. Uh, then I, I think the, the Spycast podcast always very interesting. That's for what I'm listening to. But I'm also listening to stuff like podcasts on content marketing. Because as you said, a lot of things that apply to content marketing can be adapted to intelligence. So if you want to, you know, convince your customer that your product is good, then you have to put effort in that. So um, that's something I'm listening to. Reading wise, right now I'm reading uh, Three Horizons, which is about the technique of Three Horizons, which is uh, a horizon scanning technique, so on the foresight part of the of the house. And yeah, that's. What I'm into right now. I just started to to uh, watch now for watching um, the last public appearance of Randolph Fearson. He was interviewed from Professor Barry Zulauf, and you can you know just put it into into YouTube or Google and find it. It's uh, uh, more than one and a half hours, and it's very a very good interview. It gives you a sense of the like professional person, Randall Fearson, and how he became what he got in the end. So what he was. So like a mentor to generations of analysts and a visionary when it comes to structured analytic techniques. So that's something that I would highly recommend to watch that. Absolutely. I think the first time I opened Structured analytic techniques for intelligence analysis. I thought I found like a, you know, um, I think you will notice, uh, you know, these cheat code books. Yeah. That you could buy, you know, absolutely. <laughs> so 
when I read it, I was like, is like, is this supposed to be known? And it it boggles my mind how it's not used more, even even in like international relations and courses, and you know, because I think in other areas and arenas it it could be developed really well. And I think you said something about content marketing, and for us, you're like we we are so serious about that that we hired a content marketer. Okay, not it. And luckily, he has an he has an international relations and security background. He went to King's. On top, uh, all right. Yeah, on top of that. So best of both worlds, and he's amazing. And and he started in December. So so we are very serious. At, we practice what we preach um, when we talk about this. No, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely going to read the book. Three Horizons, I, I know really well. It's, I think it's by McKinsey, right? Uh, McKinsey, no, no, they McKinsey, just yeah. adopted it. Okay. All so right. the original concept is by Bill Sharp. Okay. But McKinsey me, adopted yeah. it, right? Yeah, let me uh, write this down. You know, normally I don't, um, I don't really talk about like what I'm reading. Sometimes I say it, and sometimes I don't. But you've inspired me to, um, especially from our last talks, to to read more about you know intelligence and and, and intelligence books. And one that I've been that I just started with that that I can really like highly recommend people is have you ever heard of the book Orbit? No. So for me it was a, a big one because you know from a from a human perspective Orbit is it's a technique it's the science of report based interviewing for law enforcement security and military. All right. That's the, that's the title for the book too, and it has like uh, multiple authors and has different techniques. From like interrogations to debriefing to, and a lot of the a lot of the ones you will know, so like a passive listening and active listening and these type of things. And and it's if if you interview people uh, even in a non security uh, setting, it's a it's an immense immensely good book. So I can highly recommend it. And another book, I think I've mentioned this before because you mentioned content marketing, is a book by Nicholas Cole, and it's called. The art and business of online writing. All right, sounds very interesting. It is. It really is because it goes into a lot of the intelligence writing, and I don't know if he knows anything about this, but a lot of the stuff that you see in intelligence writing that are best practices he's doing in his book and beyond, because he's doing it for an online audience, and and he talks about where to go, where to where to post if you want people to read your work and. And all that kind of stuff, because this is something we repeat every week at our meetings. If you write something, but people are not interested in in, in reading it, then you might as well just not done it. So yeah, put some some effort in in your titles, your your the the, the imagery that you use, your 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 chapters, and, and all this kind of stuff, and then break that down. He goes very he goes very mm -hmm. into like the structure of paragraphs even. Yes. You know, how to how to structure a paragraph. And it's a lot like communicating with intelligence. You know yes. that book? Yeah. Right? Fantastic book. And so if you have those two actually you you you're you're halfway there. So Ole, uh, outside of your reading recommendations, I'm aware that you also are writing two books. Yes. Talk a little true. bit about that. Uh yes. Actually it's two books. So it is written together with Randall Fierson and with Dr. Oliver Gnard. And the original idea was to have a G German book on intelligence on structured analytic techniques, because there is none. And so, as I said, in different contexts, it's very hard to push this topic forward if you do not have anything in German. And so the idea was, a couple of years back, to admit that, to have a German book which not only describes structured analytic techniques, but also shows how to apply that in, in real life case studies. And along the way, I think it was Randy's idea. He said, well, we can have a, we can have like an English version of that book. And so we, we made the decision to write two books. Okay. Which is a lot of work to do two books on different two different languages at the same time. 
So the German and the English books, they are like 85% the same, more or less. And so the English book will be published by Springer. I think it will be beginning of April. And the title will be Clear Thinking, Structured Analytic Techniques and Strategic Foresight for Decision Makers. So don't get confused by the, by the title. So Springer wanted to have four decision makers in there. Although, well, it is for analysts basically, right? So the product is for decision makers, but they, well, it's see your reasons, right? So, and the, the German title will be, will be Klarheit im Denken, Strukturierte Analyse, Techniken und Strategische Vorausschau. And I really hope they will not push in for decision makers there, <laughs> but I'm not sure yeah. if, if they will or will not. And yeah, and it took us a lot of time to write those two books. And actually, Randy, he did the last proofreading till the, I think it was the 6th of January, and he died on the 11th of January. So you can say he, he worked all the way till this passing away uh, on that book. So he was really hyped about the book and uh, put in a lot of effort. And without him, this book would not exist, obviously. And yeah, well, that will be published in April and the German version will be published in the summer of 2024. Sounds good. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Ola, thank you so much for your time. It, it, has, it has flown by. So we will, we will communicate this, this uh, better on and, and probably we'll add this to the, to the podcast when it comes out. You'll be able to sign up for the courses through our platform to all this. Uh, it's limited to 15 people, as I understand it. So very small classes. So get there in time, guys. And we will communicate more about it when the time comes. And Ole, thank you so much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you a lot for having me. And guys, for anybody listening, if you made it this far, give us a review. I say this every week. Nobody does it. So please review the podcast. I know thousands of you listen to this thing. So uh, it would be nice for you to review the podcast so more people can find it. And also for us to know what to do better uh, or what not to do. So... If I may add one thing. Go ahead. For the review part, that's the same with getting feedback for intelligence products, right? Yes. You always want to get feedback for your intelligence products, but usually you don't get it from the decision maker. So guys, now you are the decision maker, usually complaining that you don't get feedback. So now it's your turn. Love that. Now that's that's a that's a per now, now I'm gonna say it that way next time. This is the new standard. We're gonna just clip this and I'll add this at the end of each podcast. Yeah, thank you guys and uh, I'll see you the next time. Bye bye.